I'm Sharon Nazarian. I'm the founder and the chair of the Community Advisory Thank you, Board for the Nazarian Center. Um, you're in for a real treat this afternoon. Um, I'm here to introduce our guest uh, speaker today and give you a little bit of his biographical background, but I've tell you that um, he, Professor Manashri is not only an amazing colleague and a great um, scholar, but he's also a dear friend visiting from Israel. He's going to be teaching two courses for us. He's in the middle of one right now, um, and we'll be teaching another one next quarter. So we're really, really pr privileged to have him. And probably if you visit Israel and you mention Iran, the name Iran and um, Professor Manashri are synonymous. So you can't go anywhere in Israel without uh, recognition of um, Professor Manashri's contributions on analysis on Iran. Um, I want to first and foremost thank all our co-sponsors for the event today. We can't put these on together on campus without the help of many of our sister centers, which include the UCLA International Institute Academic Programs, the Berkel Center for International Relations, the Center for Middle East Development, and the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. So thank you for our partners for making today possible. A little bit of a background for Professor Maneshri. He is a professor emeritus at Tel Aviv University and senior research fellow at the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies and the Dayan Center for Middle East and African Studies at Tel Aviv University. He's held very many, many leadership roles at Tel Aviv University when it comes to Iran. In winter and spring, of 216, as we speak now. He is the Israel Institute Visiting Professor at the UCLA YNS Nazarian Center for uh, Israel Studies. The titles of his two courses you'll see are fascinating. The one he's currently teaching this quarter is titled Iran and the Middle East Between Doctrine and Interest, and that's being taught right now in the winter quarter. And next quarter, he'll be teaching a class titled Iran and Israel, 1948, to 2015, from, alliance to, to, from allies to adversaries. So that's also a very fascinating topic. For most of you to know, I don't know if Professor Manashi publicizes, but he was born in Iran and came to Israel with his family at a very young age. He speaks fluent Persian, so he brings all of that um, to his analysis. As I mentioned, uh, Professor Manashi is an internationally recognized Iran scholar and he was the founding director of the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies, the first of its kind in Israel, from 2005 to 2010. And he was the first incumbent of the Paris and Puran Nazarian Chair for Modern Iranian Studies. That's my uncle, different Nazarian. 1997 to 2011. You can see we all have great interest in this topic. Professor Menashe also served as the chair of the Department of Middle Eastern and African History from 90, 1996 till 2000 and was a dean for special programs from 2001 to 2010 at Tel Aviv University. Um, following his retirement, he did a stint um, as president of the College of Law and Business in Ramat Gan, Israel, but we're really happy that he actually came back to Tel Aviv and is teaching on Iran. Right, right, David? Yes, he's smiling over there. Um, you know, he uh, has done amazing uh, teaching all around the world as Fulbright scholars at Princeton and Cornell, He's been a visiting professor at multiple universities around the world, in Australia, in Japan, in Germany. And probably most influential, probably in his work, was the time he spent in Iran as a student in the 1970s, where he spent two years conducting research, he was a grad student, and field studies in Iranian universities, really on the eve of the Islamic Revolution. And that was possible from, uh, from a grant from the Ford Foundation, so he really was there right at the cusp of the revolution, was able to spend two years and really understand the fabric of Iranian society, and then had to leave. <laughs> Professor Manashi has authored and edited more than 10 books and published numerous articles on Iran and the Middle East. I won't mention all of them, but if you like to look him up on, on the internet, you'll see that his topics are timely and very, very important. Um, are we are on the eve of the Iranian uh, parliamentary elections, um, so I think this talk is very, very timely as well. I hope that um, after Professor Manashi will give uh, his talk, um, we will introduce our, I will introduce our moderator now, who has graciously agreed to moderate the talk, and we'll open up to Q&As, and please ask him, you know, ask him any questions you have, all your curiosities about this Iranian regime that seems to be opaque and, and difficult to understand. 
I'll take a couple of moments to also thank and introduce our moderator. Dr. Benjamin Rod is a lecturer in public law and political science at the UCLA Department of Political Science. His courses and research interests include comparative constitutionalism, Islamic law and politics, and Iranian studies. His published dissertation was on the Iranian constitutional development and gives frequent public lectures on Iranian politics, international relations of the Middle East, and political Islam. Dr. Rod obtained his PhD right here in, from UCLA in 2015, and before that, he received his JD from Stanford Law School in two, 2003. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Manashri to come up and give his talk, and please enjoy this wonderful treat that we have. Uh, I've been several times to Los Angeles, and, uh, but it is the first time that I came in with my wife to stay for six months. I was surprised to hear that this is the winter uh, quarter. <laughs> okay, I, I wait to see what is the spring brings with it. Uh, and uh, I, I really uh, think it's important for scholars to live in different places. And uh, Dr. Uh, Nazarian mentioned <coughs> my two years as a graduate student of Tel Aviv University to Tehran University just before the revolution. And I think much of what I had really uh, learned about Iran was not that much from books, but rather from living with the Iranians, with the people, and witnessing their life, their concerns, their joy, and their uh, 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 bad times. Now, the topic is very uh, uh, wide, and I try to do uh, more than one thing. I want to discuss several issues, but to begin with giving you some background about what I think is important to understand about, and, uh, about Iran. And I want to speak about this triangular issue that speak, is uh, Iran, uh, United States, and the Middle East. But I'd also stress two main issues that are developing. One is we have just passed the uh, uh, implementation day of the nuclear deal. And the other is what we are coming in two years, the elections in Iran, so in between the deal and the elections, I would like to discuss as much as I can the, uh, this triangular relationship between Iran, United States, and the Middle East. Uh, I, I should begin by a few, few uh, preliminary comments. Uh, Iran is a very complex country. You know, you read Iranian newspapers, you think everything is rosy. You read foreign newspapers, everything is black. There is no black and white. Iran is, Iran is a very... <coughs> what, what I won't do for you. Okay. So Iran is a very complex country. Uh, it, I think it's, it is important because there is no one face to Iran. There is nothing, something that can say, this is Iran. I've studied Iran more than 40 years, and I can tell you, I cannot tell you what is Iran, because there are so many different Irans and different interpretations of their philosophy or their history or their culture. One thing which is not sufficiently, uh, I think, uh, understood in the West is the degree of the impact of the domestic situation on Iranian regional policy. When we speak about Iran in the Middle East or Iran in the United States, if, if after all, I could say almost everything is domestic. And I would like to see these, these developments from perspective of Iranian internal uh, uh, view. The other point about, about the Middle East, we are going through a very uh, I think uh, uh, delicate times in the history of the Middle East. I think ever since the, these nation states have been created, mainly after World War I, for the first time we see that something is shaking, something is not stable. The whole system of nation state that we saw that being so solid in the Middle East, uh, some of the states today are in the danger of disintegration. <coughs> Some of them are not functioning or mal malfunctioning. Consider Syria, consider Iraq, consider Yemen, Libya. You, you name it, wherever you go, you see problems, internal problems in different parts of the Middle East. The superpowers in the Middle East, this game is also being changed. They, 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 somehow there is the impression, at least in the Middle East, 
that the Americans are fed up from this region and looking for the first opportunity to get out. On the other hand, you see Russia is stepping in. Is there a change of guard in the Middle East with these two major powers? And where is Europe standing? And now just to make things much more, comp even more complicated, we hear today more and more about Sunni Shia divide. When I was a student at uh, Tel Aviv University and I studied Islam, I don't remember we spoke so much about Shiite Islam or Sunni Islam. I remember the first thing I wrote a letter from Tehran Te Te to my professor at Tel Aviv University. I said, what you taught us about Islam is not what I see in Iran. The Islam that I saw in Iran is different from what I saw in the West Bank or in, in the Gaza Strip it, or I learned about the Middle East. No one spoke about the Shiites. The Iran is an emerging force. And there is hardly any conference today on the Middle East. They, they don't focus on Iran or Shiite Islam or Shiite Sunni. We have a joke among scholars when you go to conferences that there is always a session about sushi, the Sunni-Shiite divide. <laughs> so it's a, and usually it's af after lunch. And finally, you know, this, this introduction is the, the, the nuclear deal. The nuclear deal that it really changed the rules of the games in many ways in the Middle East. There is a new reality after the implementation day, but this is a reality that we don't know right now how it is going to develop. So I, I gave you the, some keywords of the difficulties to understand the param new parameters in which we are discussing the Middle East. Let me, let me start this part by uh, three uh, preliminary, uh, another introductory questions, and I try to provide brief answers to. And I think these are the three questions that, in my view, are essential to understanding Iran. And there is some misconception or misunderstanding uh, as, as much as I meet people and speak with people. The first question is, to what degree this phenomenon that we call Islamic revolution in Iran is Islamic? In what ways the roots of this movement is religious Islamic? Today, everything is Islamic. Islamic revolution, Islamic terrorism, Islamic extremism, Islamic republic, Islamic, Islamic, Islamic. But what was the aim of the revolution is 37 years ago, when these young people of Iran went to the streets overthrowing the Shah's rule and seeking to establish a new future for their country, what was their vision? Was it to return to Islam or something more? Well, of course, when you ask this question, to what degree the roots of the revolution were Islamic, it's, uh, the answer is clear. The roots are Islamic, because in Islam, everything is Islamic. <laughs> everything has to do with Islam. <laughs> how we are, it's, it's the same like Judaism. How, even what we eat and how we are dressed in political system, uh, everything is Islamic. So if your definition of religion is Middle Eastern, the revolution was Islamic because it was social, economic, political, cultural, anti-imperialist. It was not necessarily to return to the seventh century. It was, however, a revolution that resulted in the formation of Islamic Republic. The people who went to the revolution had, in my view, three main aims, not yet have been accomplished, certainly not fully. First. Social justice, second, political justice, and respect. I can say even shorter. There was a struggle for bread, freedom, welfare, liberty, and dignity. For me, it's important to understand this point, because if this is correct, the final stabilization of the Islamic regime does not have to do much with a degree of return to Islam but rather to the degree that the grievances of the young people of Iran, the search for liberty and freedom, and freedom, search for welfare will be materialized, and so far they have not been. They have been much more successful in returning the, to the people of Iran the dignity, respect, and the national proud of the Iranian, of the Iranian state. So, to this question, to what degree it was Islamic in its roots, I can say this was a uh, an Islamic, a, a movement that brought about Islamic regime rather than Islamic revolution or Islamic roots to the revolution. 
The second question is, so the first question was to what degree the roots of this revolution were religious or Islamic. The second question is, to what degree the philosophy of the revolution, the ideology of this revolution is Islamic. And again, the question is, what do we mean by Islamic philosophy, Islamic ideology? One should remember that there is no one interpretation of Islam. There is one Islam. There is one Judaism. There is one Christianity. But we don't live today as Jews, as Judaism used to be 3,000 years ago. Christianity is not exactly what it used to be 2,000 years ago. And why should we believe that Islam remained as it was in the seventh century when Prophet Muhammad brought it to earth? There are so many different interpretations of Islam, sometimes in conflict with each other. The Islamic philosophy doesn't change every day, or interpretation, interpretations don't change from day to day. But over 14, 15 centuries, you can see different interpretations. And I can give you in one sentence what a leading Iranian intellectual said about it uh, some time ago. This man was the head of the Cultural Revolution in Iran, and his sentence was very uh, eye-opening. Opener. There is no one interpretation of Islam, says Abdul Karim Surush. There is no one interpretation that is better than the other, and there is no final interpretation of Islam. And in a very courageous way, he added, and there can be no official interpretation of Islam. Namely, even Islamic regime cannot tell you this is the only way to understand Islam. Why? Because that's the way I happen to think. That is not Islamic. Now, I'll give you an example. When Khomeini came to Iran victorious in uh, uh, 1st of February, 79, there have been seven grand ayatollahs in Iran. None of them supported Ayatollah Khomeini. Okay? Seven, the highest ranking Ayatollahs in Iran, none of them supported Ayatollah Khomeini's philosophy. The number one Ayatollah in Iran of that time went to house arrest until he passed away six years later. The man that Ayatollah Khomeini prepared to inherit him, to, su to be successor as the supreme leader, was removed from grace before Khomeini passed away, and he went to house arrest and spent the last four years of his life in house arrest, Ayatollah Montazari. In, in preparation for the elections to the Council of Experts, which I come to it later on, in two days, among the people who were not qualified to run, to the, this highest religious council was the grandson of Ayatollah Khomeini. Hassan Khomeini, the grandson of Ayatollah Khomeini, who did not, was not allowed to run because he doesn't fit Islamically to run, God forbid. Ayatollah Khomeini, by the way, has 15 grandchildren. Seven of, the, seven of them recently criticized publicly the conduct of the Islamic regime. So it shows you that it's very difficult to define what is Islamic in the philosophy. There are different interpretations, and I think that we should be attentive and understand that there is a degree of pluralism also among Shiite clerics of Iran. The third question is to what degree the policy of the Islamic regime is in line with the ideology with which this regime came to power. And here, no surprise, the Iranian regime is like any other revolution in history or any other ideological movement moving from, moving from opposition to power. You know, in opposition, in the Middle East, they say there is no tax on promises. In election campaign, you can say whatever you want. When you come to power, with authority, often enough, comes responsibility. To what degree the policy is in line with the ideology with which they came to power. From the first day of the Islamic Revolution, there is constant deviation from dogmatic principles in favor of national interest of the state, of the interest of the ruling elite. They didn't have to wait long. For example, the first decision in foreign relations was how you call 
the Gulf of Water dividing between Iran and the Arab countries. The Persians call it the Persian Gulf. The Arabs call it Al-Khalij al-Arabi, the Arab Gulf. And Khomeini's philosophy is that there is no difference between Muslims. All Muslims are brothers. There is no difference between Persians, Bal Alzeris, Baluch, Turks, Kurds. When it comes to the name of the Persian Gulf, he said the name should be Persian. And it's the only legitimate name to call it Persian. And there was an Ayatollah Khalkhali, who was the, the butcher, you say. Okay, I, politically correct, I didn't want, but I quote you. The man was the head of the revolutionary courts in Iran. The, the only very smart idea that I heard from him, that he went to Ayatollah Khomeini and suggested to him, let's solve this problem between us and the Arabs and call the Gulf the Gulf of the Muslims. What is better than that? Khomeini said, no, the, the Gulf will be Persian Gulf. The constitution of Iran says that all Muslims are brothers. It's from 79. Then you go down in the constitution and the article dealing with the qualification or the, the who can be president says that the president of Iran must be a Shiite of Iranian origin. <laughs> and the first elections to, power, to presidency in Iran, the, one of the leading candidates was Jalal al-Din Farsi, Jalal al-Din the Persian. <laughs> Four days before election, they found that the father of Farsi was Afghan and Khomeini disqualified him. I could have gone, gone one more and more. But I think that in each and every case that there was a clash between ideology and interest, interest won over ideology. I don't want to mean that ideological movements, they wake up in the morning and say, well, what can I do today against my promises? No, they want to do what they promised. But when there is a conflict between ideology and interest, usually interest wins over ideology. There was a war in Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijan Shiite in war with Armenia, which is Christian. Whom did Iran support? Armenia, the Christians, fighting with Shiites. Where is the ideology? I don't see there much ideology. So the third question that I was trying to raise is to what degree the ideology was in line, the policy is in line with ideology. Uh, there, is, there are constant deviation from dogmatic principles. Now, how much you can go away from your dogma how, in what rate, and in what field. On this, this is the, ma the main issue in controversy between different groups, different camps in Iran. So there are two major camps in Iran. There are many more, there are subdivisions, but for simplicity of our discussion, I'm saying one group is what you can call reformist, pragmatic, moderate if you want. The other one is radicals, extremists, traditionalists, conservatives, these are the two competing also groups that are running for parliament on Friday. Let me say a word about the first groups, the more reformist, moderate. Iran is a wonderful civil society. The, if you look at the Iranian women organization, it's, one, it's probably the most active women organization in the Middle East, including Israel. Cinema industry in Iran is wonderful. Newspapers published in Iran, as long as they are being allowed to be published, they are fascinating to read. Book published in Iran. Let me give you an example of title of book published by Iran, all of them by revolutionaries, or initially started as, as, as stout uh, revolutionaries. Akbar Ganji wrote a book, a fascist interpretation of religion and state. In the book, he claims that the Islamic regime of Iran is fascist. Well, of course he went to jail. You can't write such a book and not visit the jail. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm not, uh, it's not a joke. You can't write, but the book was published in 10 editions in a few months. When I spoke about this relative freedom of expression and of uh, jury, uh, newspapers in Iran, there are so many fascinating newspapers. It was in, I remember 2004, in the, the group of our veteran uh, foreign ministry officials, and one of the former ambassadors asked me how you can speak about even relative freedom of expression when 100 liberal newspapers were shut down in Iran in five years. I told him, this, this is your answer. Show me another country in the Middle East which has 100 liberal newspapers to shut them down. <laughs> so it depends which half of the glass you look. I, I, don't, I don't advise you to go and buy tickets to live in Iran. Well, I'll come to the, to the other side in a moment. There is also the half empty. 
But this, uh, this uh, uh, situation in which there are some signals of openness and then much of suppression, I was speaking with a friend who teaches in one of the Iranian universities about this dichotomy. And he told me, you know, David, they said we don't have freedom of expression. That's not true. We have freedom of expression. What we don't have is freedom after expression. <laughs> and, and, he, and he was serious. And he, and he was serious. Because they speak up, they go to jail, they come out and continue. Well, my, many of them come to the United States. They don't live in Iran, after all. But, but I think, so I paid my dues to these nice faces of civil society and the liberals, moderates in Iran. The problem is they don't, they do not control policy making in the country. Because all power is rested in the other camp. Radical, extremists, conservatives, traditionalists. And they have at least three major elements of power. One, they speak in the name of God. They wake up in the morning, and I don't know how, they know exactly what is the will of God in the same moment. <laughs> well, we have some of them in Jerusalem also, so we know we're familiar with it. They, they know, I don't want to go to details how they exchange views, but they, they, get, they, get, they get messages or they get whatever they know. They, they know. And it is very powerful in traditional society when you can speak to the people in the name of God and tell them this is the will of God. Now, if the will of God is not enough, God forbid, it should be enough, they have the revolutionary guards, the army, the military, the force of enforcement, enforcement of the law. So if you have the will of God on one hand and the might of the army on the other, or revolutionary guards on the other hand, what else do you need? Or oh, there is another thing, which we have plenty, the will to fight for their survival. The clerics did not get power in Iran to give it up voluntarily. And uh, one of the contenders for the Council of Experts, Mesbah Yazdi, who taught the Iranians how to fight with the young people. While they were suppressing students in 1999, and it continued also in 2009, he, 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 on Friday sermon, he said that whoever thinks that Islam is a religion of mercy does not understand what is the meaning of Islam. Islam says this grand ayatollah is a religion that dictates to us to take sharp sword and cut the heads and tongues of people who speak or act against us. So if you have this will to fight, you can see and you could see how they suppressed the opposition in 2009, in 1999 and other movements. And the point is that power is in their hand. As I said, gradually there is constant change. I do not going to discuss with you the different phases of change. It started from the first day. It went through the war between Iraq and Iran. It went on uh, late, later on with uh, the movement in 2009, the Arab Spring in 2011, and reached its last stage with the election of Rouhani to the presidency in 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, and since the 2013, the Iranian-American relations coming to the United States and Iranian-European mm -hmm. relations are focusing on the nuclear, the nuclear uh, plan. I, I should start with a kind of disclaimer. I was probably one of the first Israelis who supported dialogue between Iran and Israel. And I, when I was asked by my friends in America, among the American Jews, about in 2008, I mean. Before Obama was elected, I thought uh, dialogue is the best way to solve the problem with Iran. Uh, well, I, now I, I believe uh, my, uh, my friends, Iranian friends in Los Angeles will not invite me anymore. Uh, because many of them think differently, but I, I, thought, I, sti I still think that the dialogue was the best, best way to solve the problem with Iran. I simply didn't know how bad a deal can be, and I'll come to it later. How this was possible? The deal was possible, I heard many people say, this is because Iran changed its policy. I think differently. The deal became possible because of the United States of America changed its policy. And the change in American attitude was before Rouhani was elected. Already during the time of Ahmadinejad, Iranian-Americans negotiations started. 
So we see that administration in the United States eagerly striving to make, to reach agreement, and this was the prerequisite for change. The other prerequisite was that the Iranian, following domestic uh, pressure, elected Rouhani to be president of Iran. Rouhani is not a moderate man. When I hear that he is moderate, I'm, my body is shaking. But you know, he, he changed. And compared to the other contenders, he was relatively milder, relatively more moderate. In a way, when I go back to my own writings about radicals and pragmatists, reformists in Iran, and I see who are the, uh, who are the people who have been radicals in the 80s, all of them are the leading reformists today. They, they just, in due, due time, they change their attitude. Take the people who are un, in house arrest, Karubi, Rouhani, Khalkhali, uh, uh, Khatami, all the names that you know in the, in the camp of the reformists, they started in ultra, ultra radicals. But people also change. Not only you know, revolutions change, but people also adjust themselves to the new realities. The other reason for the change was the devastating domestic situation in Iran. Two years ago, Iran was in a miserable situation economically. They were on their knees asking to have deal, to, have, to get way to unfreeze their asset. The inflation, unemployment, and all other uh, economic uh, malaise. And also in the region, their ally Syria was bleeding, Bashar, uh, Bashar al-Assad. In Iraq, they were losing grounds. In Bahrain, they were seemingly losing the battle over Bahrain. So you could see that also in the region, uh, United, uh, Iran was confronting a hostile re uh, attitude. And basically, met, there was criticism at home. Even on the question why we have to support Iraq with so much money, what are the benefits for the country? What we are doing in Syria? And when Syria used nuclear, uh, not nuclear, uh, chemical weapon against its own people, there was also criticism inside the country in Iran. So I think that at this stage, Iran has made it, its decision to make a tactical retreat to gain their strategic gain. And therefore, they allowed Rouhani to be elected. They Khamenei allowed him to negotiate with Iran but only to negotiate about the, the, about the nuclear issue, nothing else. During this negotiation, when they were the la final stage of these negotiations, <laughs> two days before it was, the deal was done, Khamenei went public saying that America is the great Satan and the call great of, uh, uh, that death to America is, is part of the uh, essence of the Islamic revolution. So they didn't make secret of it, that they want to deal only with the nuclear issue. The other elements that helped coming to this conclusion were the regional developments, the Arab Spring, and unfulfilled promises of the Arab Spring, what happened in, in Syria, in Libya, and other parts of the Middle East. So Iran had good reason, for its own sake, to deal to get into the deal and sign the agreement. Who, who gained from this, from this deal? It's first and foremost Iran. They knew how to negotiate. Uh, they knew that the Americans are eager to make uh, the deal. And they raised the price. And there was someone who was willing to pay the price. I don't want to say what I would have done if I was in place of the American decision making. But at this stage, they decided that they won the deal. And it was a legitimate price, they think, that they had to pay. Uh, so where was Iran then and what it is today? Where is today? Just imagine two years ago, I said Iran was on its knees, desperately seeking for some kind of compromise deal, agreement about it with the United States. <coughs> what did Iran gain now? First, for the first time, the Islamic Republican system of Iran gained international recognition. 
This is the first time that the Americans called the regime in Iran Islamic Republic of Iran. Their nuclear program, although delayed in 10, 15 years, which is in historical uh, standards tomorrow morning, what is 10, 15 years? So some people here know that 10, 15 years pass very long, very, very, very fast. And is, uh, in the, well, so you sacrifice something immediate uh, for the short run, you gain something much bigger for the long run. And it is another misconception and misunderstanding. Ayatollah Khamenei said that we are showing what is, was translated into Iran as, into, into English as heroic flexibility. Uh, this is not really the, what, he, what the Persian phrase said. Uh, which is showing a situation if these two boxers on the stage fighting with each other, sometimes you have to retreat one step to go back and attack. So that's that heroic flexibility, going one step to, to, to punch uh, in the face. And basically, what this was in, in the Islamic meaning of this phrase. So they, they, they went one step back and preparing to move ahead. With the, with the agreement, even before the agreement was signed, the sanction regime has been removed. For assets started to be, not before, but are already are unfrozen or in the way to be totally fully unfro unfrozen. Uh, Iran get billions and billions of dollars and that even uh, Secretary of State Kerry says that, is, that no one can be sure that part of the money will not go to radical or uh, Islamist movements. More than that, I think that for the first time you can see smiles in Iran. You know, Shiites don't smile often. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, you know, they had 12 Imams, 11 of them were killed, the 12 disappeared, and the history of Shiites is very sad history. But for me, smile is a, is a sign that I appreciate. I, I, I checked uh, how many pictures I have of Ayatollah Khomeini smiling. I found only one. The one that he kisses Yasser Arafat, that he visited Iran <laughs> in, two time, in February, in the first month of the Islamic Republic. I beg you to find other pictures in which he smiled and sent me. There was another Ayatollah who was under house arrest, Ariyat Shariat Madari, who was smiling, moderately. And so it's, for me, smile is meaningful. I was in uh, Oxford five years ago for sabbatical, and then a friend of mine gave me a book of a young woman to read that uh, about, uh, about Iran and social atmosphere in Iran. And I like the, 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 the preface already, in which is, she tells the story that for the first time that she came to visit Iran after a long, long time, uh, he, she, she was speaking with the taxi driver and then after, after 10 minutes, the driver tells her, tell me, you are not Iranian, isn't it? Or you have not been to Iran for a long time. She said, yes, but how do you know? He said, you are smiling. And people in Iran don't smile these days. Smile came back to the face of the Iranians. They feel confident. They feel powerful. They feel successful. And I was just recently in a conference with Iranian colleagues and I tell you, they move like around like uh, peacocks, happy with themselves, proud of themselves, and rightly so. So I think that the atmosphere in Iran is much better, which has its dangers also. God forbid, and the expectations are not fulfilled. This is something that this regime should take into account. They are happy today, but they are expecting something. Iran is courted by foreign countries. All businessmen are in the hotels. Hotels of Iran, Tehran, are full with businessmen. Uh, and could, I could uh, go on and on to describe the benefits that Iran had. In a short way, I would say that I, Rouhani uh, uh, fulfilled his election promises. What he said in his election campaign, I am going to return to you the value of your passport and the value of your real, the currency. I don't know many 
leaders who say that they are going to bring the, to their people back the value of their passport, the pride. You can, be, you can be proud with your nationality because Iran was isolated. And today, look at who is isolated. It's not Iran. My country is much more isolated than Iran is. So, uh, so I think that Iran became much more uh, uh, cooperative with the outside world. All other countries, almost all, looking for uh, relations with Iran, business with Iran, and uh, Iranian situation in the in the region is improved. With Russia coming to Syria, Bashar al-Assad is is feeling much better today than two years ago. The situation in Iran is better. Hezbollah is more uh, to itself uh, compared to two years ago. What is my problem with this, uh, with the nuclear program? My, my problem with the, uh, with the deal is that it doesn't deal, it, it deals only with the nuclear issue. And it doesn't deal with Iranian behavior in domestic policy, restrictions of freedoms, support for extremism and radical movements in the, in the world. And I think these are the missing parts on this, on this uh, uh, equation. Now, not everything is rosy in Iran. And uh, I mentioned earlier the danger of unfulfilled expectations. Uh, if the Iranian people are not going to see improvement in the economic situation, and I don't think that today they are so much optimistic about the political freedoms that they will gain. I don't think that they really expect much in this field. And therefore, the next elections uh, in, two, in two days are going to be indicative if President Rouhani will be able to deliver and satisfy the expectations of the people. I make another point here that due, due, throughout this uh, time, Iran continued with its anti-American policy, day after day. And Khamenei continued with its uh, statements about Iran, be, uh, America being the great Satan, America, well, it basically said two different things. The America cannot do anything, uh, any damn thing. I don't know how to translate it into English. Or the, the same breath bre bre is say that all our problem, America cannot do us any wrong. But the second sentence there after, he says, all our problems are because of the United States. And someone asked me, if, if, all, if they cannot do anything bad to us, so how all, all our problems are because of, because of the Americans. One uh, qualification here, the Iranian people are not anti-American. If you want to be a billionaire or millionaire in Iran, just open an office and sell visa to the United States. You will be rich in a in, in few days. Uh, a friend of mine was uh, one of the hostages in the American embassy in the 79 to 81. He said that uh, there was on the wall of the American embassy graffitis in the early days of the revolution. And one of them says, Yankees go home. And one Iranian wrote in Persian under it, and take me with you. <laughs> so the attitude of the people is different than the attitude of the government. And for, the, for Khamenei, therefore, it's important to stick to this anti-Americanism because for a revolution that has withdrawn from so many principles, in their dogmatic pre, uh, agenda to withdraw from this anti-Americanism, almost a confession of a failure of their dogmatic uh, revolutionary uh, uh, principles. The hour after the deal, the Iranians are demonstrating their strength. They're speaking about their strength. Now I need you, uh, Christian. And do it very briefly. You see, this is in the website of Ayatollah Khomeini. There are, by the way, most uh, Ayatollahs in Iran are against internet, except that each of them has a website. <laughs> <laughs> so on the website of Khamenei, Khamenei, this is the iron fist. And you can see his, that what it says, translated from above. You can read it, isn't it? Those who leveled sanctions against us yesterday are dying today because Iran has become the region's foremost military power. Khamenei 
on, in August, a month after this deal, the power hungry order led by the United States of America is the perfectly clear embodiment of the concept of the enemy. America has no human morality. It carries out evil, evil crimes under the guise of flurry statements and smiles. He called, of course, for jihad against the forces of arrogance. Defense Minister of Iran. You have them? Okay, you can, uh, I'll read it to you. <laughs> we are with the, this Khamenei ego, another one, the defense minister. <coughs> yes. The, uh, today, Iran has attained such status that the superpowers have, un have surrounded to it because its majesty, its steadfastness, its, its resistance and unity. Despite their great pride, the regime of arrogance, the West, led by the United States, sat humbly behind the negotiating table, table and obeyed the rights of the Iranian people. That's the way they are showing their success. This is the iron fist of Iran. They destroyed the power of the United States. Uh, so for them, this is a, uh, the opportunity to show their people that their negotiation was not retreat from dogma and the interests of, the, of Iran, but rather safeguarding Iranian, uh, Iranian uh, uh, principles and um, values. And then I come to the elections, and I try to do it uh, uh, briefly as possible. For Rouhani, for Rouhani, the president, the nuclear deal is supposed to be the beginning of a new phase of reform in Iran. Khamenei viewed realities differently. He saw that Rouhani has been elected to presidency with one assignment, to sign the deal with the five plus one. His mission has been has accomplished. And therefore, what they are doing, he and the radicals, they are trying to limit the power of the president in the next close to two years that he had to be in office before, before the next election. I think that uh, all signs show that the elections in two days, and it's dangerous to make prophecies two days before election because you will know the results in two days. <laughs> and there's also greater difficulty because the results are not totally faithful with what people want. Uh, they have in Iran a new field of studies at uh, universities that I'm glad I didn't find it in American universities. They call it election engineering. <laughs> so sometimes they engineer the results of the, of the elections. Just look at 2009. I remember I was in the studio of the Sky or, or BBC in Tel Aviv and was interviewed uh, on, the, on the day of elections, just that the polling stations were closed. And I was asked about how will be the results. I said, I, I don't know, because it's very tight. You, know, you cannot tell. And I don't trust that the results, as, as uh, stated, are the real result as people voted. And uh, so you asked me, when do you think the results will be uh, uh, clear and announced? I think it will take another day or even two. It's a country of 75 million people at that time. Manual voting, it takes time. Well, I was stupid. On the way back from the studio, one hour before polling stations were closed, I already heard the final results. <laughs> so it's uh, how they do it. And this became the final results. There's no argument about it. And then you see the students going to the streets and demonstrating about this these elections. Many people uh, put forward their candidacies to the elections. I'd make it brief by saying that the reformists had 3,000 candidates. The, the, Council of, the Council of Guardians, the body that has the right to approve the credentials of the candidates, found only 30 of them, of them fit to run. 1%, 99% of the nominees of the reformists 
have been disqualified, including sitting members of parliament. Which begs the question if the committee has done mistake approving them four years before, or they sinned during the four years in, in, in parliament. 60% of the total uh, total candid the candidates have been disapproved. It was a kind of shocking uh, uh, reality for the people who wanted really to use this opportunity to try and bring about a government or a parliament that will be supportive to reform. Now here I learned another lesson about elections. I tend to believe that when you go to vote, you usually vote for the people who are you, whom you want to bring into parliament. But when you cannot vote for your people, what do you do? What you, can, you don't have, all your nominees have been dis disqualified. So to today the name of the game is to vote for the, for the second best. Namely, not to vote for the first, for the, for the reformists, not to vote for the most prominent figures in the radical camp, but vote for the, for the people who are backbenchers, not very well known, or less radicals. And the, the whole po the play game is that the leading radicals will not be elected mainly to the Council of Experts. And by the way, the Council of Experts is the council that is empowered or assigned to choose the next supreme leader. And because this council is in the, the term of this council is eight years, and because Khamenei is 80, 76, and because of his failing age, it is possible that this uh, council elected on Friday will have to make decision who is the next supreme leader. If you lose hope that the parliament can make the, bring the change, the most important elections are for the Council of Experts, because they, 88 people, will, who will vote who is the next supreme leader. And here there is a list of people that the reformists signaled and signed that, or marked not to, not to vote. So the, the people go to vote not with the list to whom to vote, but with the list to whom not to, not to vote. It's a strange elections, but it's, uh, I, I, I believe I explain myself why I have to do it. So there are five names that not to vote. The three, the five most prominent radicals. People who know Iranian history or current events know Ahmed Jannati, Mesbah Yazdi, uh, uh, Ahmed Khatami, Jannati, Mesbah Yazdi, and Ibrahim Yazdi. There are two Yazdi and then uh, Ibrahim Yazdi. So, okay. Muhammad Yazdi, yes. The, the one who was the head of the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, no, not Ibrahim Yazdi, I said. No, 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 no. Ibrahim Yazdi is something else. Sorry, sorry. It's, it's reformist, uh, liberal, or so on. Now, let me, let me conclude. Uh, at the end of the day, I think that uh, the key to change in Iran is in the hands of the young girls and boys of Iran. As I said, I said earlier, the Iranians have a wonderful civil society. I mentioned the students, as one who lived two, of, two years of his life at Tehran University. So 70 years ago, there was not a single girl in, in Iranian universities. Today, 60-something percent of total students in Iran are female. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an irreversible process. The number of students, the graduate of universities, and, the, and they are not very happy with the realities of life. <coughs> Iran is the only country in the Middle East which has the tradition of popular upheaval and popular revolutions and change of regime. Iran had four big popular movements in the last 130 years. The Arab country, there were here and there, and recently, 2011, the Arab Spring. The Iran, the, Iran is the only country in the Middle East which has two big revolutions in the 20th century. Iran had a constitutional revolution in 1906. It's the only country which had constitutional revolution. It's the only country which had Islamic revolution. So with this proud tradition of popular intervention, I think that 
the best possible way to change realities in Iran is when the young people of Iran will take the responsibility for their future and lead to a change. One thing that we don't know in history, and I was trained as the school of history, we don't know when this will happen. I know after it happens, everyone say, I knew the sign was on the wall, don't believe them. No one knows when people one day wake up and start changing history. This is, there is no way to, to, to know sometimes such mass, mass movements begin from nowhere. I lived in Iran the last two years of the Shah's rule. I didn't see this revolution coming, and not because I was stupid, I, I believe. And I lived in, in villages, and I lived in, in places. I spoke with the people. I spoke their language. All of a sudden, people were fed up, and the leader emerged, and they started moving. So the situation that I see and I'll quote from a newspaper by the name of Jame'e. I don't know how many of you, there are some people, you know everything, so. Jame'e was a newspaper that was shut down in, 2000, in 1999. The name of this, the journal, the newspaper Jame'e is Society. And one of the Ayatollahs wrote an article in this Jame'e uh, uh, warning the young students in 1999 not to cross certain red lines and obey true Islam. And a young student, whom I know the name, but uh, no one knows about, about him, who he, who he was, an unknown person, wrote back an article the day after. The title is Pedar Jame'e Javonas, Father, the Society, or also the name of the newspaper, is young. And we want, we are young and we want to have good life. You, you preach us to obey true Islam. But who is to tell us how many Islams are there, which one of them is true, which one of them is false, and who decides? And the punchline was at the end. He said the problem is not that we, the young people, are crossing red lines. The problem is that you, the conservatives in power, in a one-way street, you are driving against the flow of traffic. If I think about the conservatives in Iran, even they win the elections and how, with what margins they will win the elections, because they ultimately, no matter how it goes, they win the elections because no, there is no one on the other camp, or not many. And they, they are driving against the flow of traffic, the weight of, they are driving against the will of the people and the desire of the people. Or either they will come back to their or change their policy and lead these young people to better life in terms of social justice, political justice, or they risk the, the, the danger of, running, of driving against the flow of traffic. As a caution, I would say that there are some people here who have driven in Tehran. There are people who had some experience in driving in Tehran. The traffic in Tehran is the worst in the world. So you can, you can drive against the flow of traffic for some time, but not for the long time. So I'd stop here. Thank you. So first question, Dr. Mashri. Um, as you mentioned, so the, the clerics all like the internet, even though they tell us they don't like the internet. Um, Khamenei himself has a Twitter um, account, which I follow, which is quite fascinating. And just a couple hours ago, he wrote, he said, by a hardliner, the enemy means those who are more determined to realize the revolution's objectives. To them, moderates are those who surrender. He gave this as guidance ahead of the um, elections. So let me ask you this. Are the parliamentary elections still relevant? Do they matter? Do they matter? Yes. They, they, they matter because at the end of the day they will be used by the. There is one thing that I want to clarify. Many I see many places say that the Khamenei is a balancing force between the radicals and the moderates. I don't think he is a balancing force. This was Khomeini in his time. Khamenei is fully with the hardliners. He is not balancing. He is in one side. This is. Uh, 
I hope it's not the Iranian intelligence. <laughs> so, okay. So, the par parliamentary elections, elections are important. See, for example, presidential election. There was a, a discontent among the people of Iraq in, total, in the 2013. And this enchantment and this illusionment reached a boiling stage. And then, by, because of the will of the people, because of the, what they sense in, in the, in the, among the people, they decided to allow someone like Rouhani to run. RF, who was then a leading candidate, gave us his place. What you know, intellectuals and liberals usually are not nice to each other. Uh, and he, RF, gave his, his place to Rouhani and allowed him to run and he stepped away. <coughs> Today, RF is the leading, RF was the uh, vice president in Iran of uh, Khatami. Today, RF is the, the leading force. You know, they don't even allow to screen the picture of, of President Khatami. That's, uh, that's how the liberal and open these Iranian journal newspapers are. And so I think that it counts mainly because they don't have a choice, you know. But this was the dilemma of the, of the, of the reformist. The last few days, the dilemma is to be or not to be. To, be to, to go to election or not to vote. To vote or not to vote. If they don't vote, all these radicals will get to parliament and the government will be fully in the hands of the, of the radicals. If they go to vote, they give legitimacy to this regime. So they learned the lesson, it's the, the tough decision, and they decided to do what I say, explained. Now, the other point that you mentioned, this is, this is the counter-reaction of the radicals to, to this uh, new game of the reformists, who are deciding uh, to whom not to vote, calling people to go and vote, but not for this, 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 and this. And if they will be able to kick out of the, of the Council of Experts or Parliament, the leading radicals, this will be uh, in soccer, it is popular in my country, said that the referee is, is showing a yellow card and then red card. This will be more than yellow card to this day. This will be a warning sign by the people. So the final point I'll say here, the, 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 what the counter uh, attack of the, of the radicals is the, the, the most popular word in Iranian radical newspapers in the last few days is nufus, influence. Those who are put by the, today's day is, is England, again, no thanks God, not America is the big, big evil, but today the BBC, the attacks on the BBC and the agents of the Brits who are on the camp of the, of the uh, of, the, of, the, of the more pragmatic. So, uh, you are political science. Tell us what is the choice that they have. Politics is not always about choice, and that's, that's sort of the, 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 the problem. It's, it's, and, and in this case, it is a lack of choice or absence of choice, I think. Um, but then. Yeah, but I'll tell you what Rouhani is saying. It's like going to a shop and you don't find. What you, what you are looking for is not available. What you do? If I, if me, I go out. But most people that I know, they buy something which is the best alternative to, to what. And that's what Hani was telling him. You don't find reformists in the list. Vote for the people who are closest to us, the second best. 